Hi, I'm Ray Pride, film critic of New City Magazine, and our website is newcityfilm.com. I'm here for a conversation with Hal Hartley as part of Olive Film Spoiler Alert series, and we're going to have some questions from readers of theray.com in a bit. But first, I think we should say hi to Hal. Hello. Hello, Ray. Nice to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah. You've been at this a while. Both of us have. Yeah. You were one of my first interviews, I think, in Chicago, uh, the first time I went out on the road to promote the first film. And we have a nice long interview in uh, Filmmaker Magazine from the time of Henry Fool, too. That was right. That I, I really enjoyed. And I have an article coming up in the summer 2018 issue of Filmmaker about how, at least from this side of the table, there seemed to be a moment from the 1990s American independent film scene that, that somehow we just assumed it would last and grow. It, even though the economics, everyone behind the scenes, especially filmmakers, knew wasn't the case. We can count on a new Hal Hartley film every year or so, or a new Todd Haynes, a Julie Dash, you know, author-driven feature films. And of course, times change. And uh, you're a filmmaker who doesn't seem either nostalgic or sentimental about how things were done once upon a time. And I hope we can talk about, we'll have time to talk about some of the series projects that you've been kicking around. But first, let's talk about the Kickstarter for your first three features to go on Blu-ray that you've got going right now on Kickstarter. Yeah, that's, um, uh, you know, a number of years ago, I decided I wanted to uh, put a little bit of my company's money into just restoring all the films um, and making them available in whatever is the best way these days. I don't know what it will be like 20 years from now, what people will be watching movies on. But, uh, but I wanted to get them all on HD and cleaned up and presentable. Um, so I'm sort of like building an encyclopedia, I think. <laughs> we did the Henry Fool trilogy uh, last year, and then we'll do this one uh, because the rights came back to me. I could do it. Um, and you know we'll see year by year we'll try to do more so i think maybe five or six years from now we might be able to have the entire body of work thus far uh presentable so this is uh it gives you control of your work and its future and so it's a labor of love but you do need to uh, do a labor of money as well which is the experiment. yeah Yes, I mean, um, it's, you know, it's not a terribly profitable thing at the moment, but, uh, but it does pay for itself. Um, it takes a little, a few years for each of these um, to pay for itself. However, you know, having a, a crowdsourced uh, project like this where people can pre-order these things uh, at sensible prices, that takes a lot of the edge off of it. Uh, we can do a lot of the work and know that there's an audience for it. Um, and after that, then we go out through um, Amazon all over the world and from my own website, halhartley.com. Um, the key thing, of course, was um, to make it viable was subtitling. Um, I think you probably remember from back in the Day, back in the 90s. I mean, subtitling was a really complicated and expensive undertaking. Um, it's still probably the most expensive part of what we're doing with these DVDs, subtitling them in five different languages. Um, but it's nowhere near as prohibitive as it used to be before the digital technology. So uh, that's really how I began thinking about five or six years ago, I just said, I have to go, get by um, nationally defined distributors in a way. I have to distribute directly all over the world at once. The same product can meet a lot of the world's language needs. And so that's what makes it viable. One thing that's always striking at the end of when you finish a season of things on uh, Netflix, that's when they put the credit for all of the subtitles. And I think 
I don't remember, do you have like nine or 10 languages? They will have listed like 34 languages that anything that they- Right, want. yeah. No, that's great. And when you have a, a large corporation like that and you have that much money, you, you really, it makes sense to do it because, you know, they're thinking globally. It's just, it's old fashioned globalism, I guess. The, uh, the early films you said in a 2008 book of conversations, which I think you can see backwards right here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you say that um, with this, uh, th with these three films, they work well together having been made by the same crew all in a line one after another. There's a consistency of style or attack. They were made almost as if no one was watching. Did that feel that way when you were assembling the materials? And maybe you could talk a little bit about the process of when you reclaim the rights or are the materials for these films, were they in someone else's hands? Were they in someone else's warehouse? How did you bring all these things mm -hmm. together? And then did they feel out of piece again? Well, it's different. No, they don't. Now I'm spending a lot of time going over these films again, side by side. These days I see the, what strike me as real differences one from the other from the unbelievable truth to trust it was a real change not simply in acquired skills more experience uh, more ambition more confidence uh, but an attempt to make a different kind of film and then after trust moving to simple men it was the same thing you know trying to make a different kind of film um and i really see that now uh you know there's a more i hesitate to say relaxed but there in the unbelievable truth there was more use of tableau let the performers do their thing in the frame i set the frame is very carefully set and activity is well understood but i'd stand back a little from it whereas trust it was a more aggressively scripted uh there was more aggressive physical activity the the blocking um it's more aggressively edited the pace you know, all that uh and i was very happy with it but you know i had i had done that now and i don't think i was thinking like i was doing something terribly original i was like thinking about kind of melodramas, probably English melodramas that I liked from the past. And, but that was done. And then by the time I was uh, designing Simple Men, I, I came to understand that I was making, yeah, a very, a third, very different kind of movie. And I was on new territory. Um, Were some of the choices pragmatic in terms of the limitations that you had? Uh, for finances, and maybe that would be an opportune way to say a little bit about the limited time and money and geographical space that you had for the first film. That's not something I feel when I'm looking at the films now or that I remember. You know, there were always budgetary limitations. The first film, The Unbelievable Truth, was made for very, very little money. And so, yeah, my creative strategy was to keep things essentially make fewer shots so that we put the energy our creative energy into the dialogue and the performances within frames that were not too ambitious but were interesting to us one of my favorite cliches from 90s indies films filmmakers talking is that dialogue has always been the cheapest special effect yes well, it worked for me because um, when I first began getting interested in making films, uh, it wasn't long before I uh, was encouraged by everybody, my teachers and friends. They said, you've got a knack for dialogue. Uh, and I did. I, I was very excited by it. Uh, you talked about how there are different styles of melodrama you've always been interested in. People can draw... Uh, influences or comparisons to certain things about Robert Bresson or other French directors like Godard, but are there some unlikely influences of, you know, say, involving dance or slapstick or, you know? 
There's a couple. Um, of yeah, I mean, the, the early silent movies always excited me. Uh, Buster Keaton, in particular, um, Harold and Lloyd. But some other things that might not be as pronounced uh, might be, like, say, the films of Alan Rudolph, for instance. I discovered those in the I'd say the three or four years before I made my first feature film. And there was something about the way he, the situations he told stories about and the way people talk to each other in their dialogue. They're almost not talking to each other. They're talking around each other. And it's, you know, I'm thinking about like Choose Me in particular. Um, Choose Me is, uh, was just shown in Chicago a few months ago on 35 millimeter and it was basically a room full of filmmakers of different ages here in Chicago, alternately sighing and moaning like, oh, this is perfect. Why can't I be this good? Yeah. Yeah. It blew me away when I saw it. When I, uh, I was back in the VHS days. I, had, I was the only one. I was renting it from my local VHS place in Midtown Manhattan for like a year again and again. And then the guys <laughs> said, why don't you just take it? You're <laughs> the only one who ever wants this tape. So I paid him like $10 and I just took it and I had it. And I was very happy that years later, many years later, I got to become friends with Alan. And uh, so I was able to tell him all these stories. Well, he's, I had a really long inter career interview with him like 15 years ago. It was already an amazing career um for a filmmaker and yeah. he's just so genial and easygoing but also very articulate about what yeah. he's doing and especially in terms of comedy and sort of what you're describing is people talking past each other yeah yeah come on throw another influence at her tell me about some melodrama I know, well uh, just i was just recently last month i spent a few days with the students at the in um university of indiana and uh, this came up in conversation, but um, Peter Brooks' film of his own production of Marat Saad, uh, that is something I forgot how instrumental that was to what, to my writing and my conception of blocking and everything. Um, and what I wanted to talk about. I discovered it around 1987. That would have been, you know, a year before I made The Unbelievable Truth. Um, it's come back again and again. I watch it like every year. I have this old DVD of it. But when I look at it now and I look at all of my films, the 30 years of working, there are a lot of... Um, you know this it's the, like a post brechtian thing and it's you just you you're it's okay to show the artifice it's okay it's in, more entertaining you know to not pretend that this is real what's going on that we're we're undertaking we're making effort to pre, to demonstrate something for you <laughs> um I've always liked that about uh, certain kinds of films and theater. Like I don't like naturalistic theater. I never go to see that sort of thing. But, uh, and then one of the, uh, the people out at Indiana used the word, I'd never heard it before, performative. They said there's a performative quality to your, your actor's uh, work. And uh, I'd never heard that word before, but I know, yeah, it, I want the, actors to to in a certain show the watcher the viewer that they know what they're doing there's a reason why they're taking this pause there's a reason why they're moving this way you know it's as simple as it's as simple as that i mean there might be other more academic ways of talking about it but uh but for me, it was just a gut reaction, just a sensibility, a taste. Um, I get bored when the story is trying to appear real. Um, 
when the reality of performing and addressing real issues, they don't have to be huge issues, personal things, um, I find that much more exciting. Well, there are manners of style, of acting style, of filmmaking style that um, come into play when anyone's making a film. Some of them are unconscious, some of the things you've grown into. But a great gift of the narrative film is that when you're photographing the human face and the human body, it weirdly becomes naturalistic even when you're also doing really strange things. Yeah. Some things I can think of an example uh, in The Master, there's some, uh, the Paul Thomas Anderson film, there are a couple of things that Philip Seymour Hoffman does, including an outburst he has in front of some genteel people that you go, is this psychologically correct? Is it this, is it? No, it's the film in front of you. It's a human doing something stylized. Yeah. Um, I yeah, think, I mean, psychology, I don't, I don't personally spend that much time thinking about psychology when I'm directing the actors or the writing. Are there any influences in terms of uh, <clears throat> use of dance and movement in your films? Because that's uh, something that's along with your own composition, something that's been a consistent um, Why you mean like the choreography kind of stuff? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's the blatant kind of choreography when people burst into dance and stuff like that, and surviving desire, and, um, and simple men, and that that's why I was bringing up the Peter Brook uh, thing and Marat Saad. You know, just that you know the, these people bursting in song all the time. They're trying to perform a play for you to tell you about the French Revolution and it keeps falling, falling apart. Um, there's that, but the other type of choreography, meaning blocking, how I move people around in the frame uh, in conjunction with uh, what they're saying. Um, it's a, you mentioned Bresson a little while ago. I mean, in my earlier years, yeah, there was a kind of restraint and the decidedness of physical activity that I was very attracted to. Uh, and so I, you know, I watched his films very closely and, and I know even when I'm making a comedy like the films I make, um, you know, there is a, I think it's probably mo most obvious in um, trust. Uh, but yeah, Bresson is an influence uh, there. But so was like Stanley Kubrick, for instance, you know, very, very different types of filmmakers. Um, but I would say that they were probably all filmmakers who evidenced certain decisiveness in their shots. You know, they're, they're well rehearsed, well understood. Um, dialogues and physical activity and even beyond the idea of stylization or not non-naturalism or anything about psychology Murat Saad, Kubrick these are all kinds of films that tell you what they are as they begin so by having a created a world through the style or the settings and I think that's the case with a few of your films you say this is what this film is. Eight minutes in, 10 minutes in, I hate it, I'm leaving, I'm turning it off. Or what is this? I'm fascinated. The film itself creates this, uh, you know, the vocabulary of itself that is mm -hmm. then given to the viewer. Yeah, no, that's a good way of saying it. Um, Kubrick was a big person who, I, all of his quotes tend to sound, you know, people try to make them sound magisterial, but I think he simply said, uh, you've got eight minutes to create the world, and if you don't, you're done. You know the audience right. is going to reject it. Right, but then your other example, Bresson, too. I mean, just that a man escaped the original title tells you what the whole movie is going to be. You know, a man condemned to death has escaped, or escaped. I think in the French, it's just a statement: a man condemned to death is will escape. You know, so there's, he actually takes all the, the tension in old fashioned sense of it out, you know, 
but it's one of the most beautiful and the most riveting movies I've ever seen. Even though you know he's going to escape, you're watching with an attention to his activities that you wouldn't have if you were worried about whether he was going to escape. Kind of an interesting. In a strange way, it's like historical films where you obviously know the ending. I mean, Titanic, how, how does Titanic have a happy ending? James right. Cameron found one, right. but at the same time, Titanic, the boat goes down, they die. What kind of love story? Right. I don't think that should be compared to Bresson to Cameron. That's just not good. Um, was the dialogue that your uh, professors, mentors, teachers were saying was good and you should persist with, were they like the Hal Hartley talk from the beginning that's funny and sad, but still unlike how most characters would talk? There's a, a favorite line of mine from, single, from Simple Men is, there's no such thing as adventure and romance, there's only trouble and desire. I mean, it sounds like something you would put on a billboard, and but the way it's played in the scene, the way it's played by the actor, all of them have their own, uh, you know, it's riveting in its own goofy way. Yeah, I, I, there was something about juxtaposing meaning with delivery. <laughs> like people be, you almost expect the other characters to say, did you, did you read that somewhere? I think I read that somewhere too. Um, but they, what's it, it's like an epigram. And people sometimes break out into epigram just like they break out into song and musicals. Um, Have you been able to use chance in your filmmaking in more recent years? I think it was the time of the girl from Monday you said you had found a word, aleatory, the, to the welcoming of chance into the filmmaking process. Has, as you've made more work since the Long Island trilogy, have you been able to open things up a little more and make them more aleatory? I, yes. Um, it started really around that time with The Girl from Monday. So the form it takes is I don't build sets or I don't, um, I do a lot less dressing of, of scenes. Uh, it's, it's not like uh, embracing improvisation or something like that. It's just taking what I've written and then spending a lot of time moving around and finding the right places to do it. Um, and to not control the environment quite as much. With The Girl from Monday, that was a great place to start because we were shooting it in conventional digital video, very small cameras, a very small crew. And we could really, we could be down in the subway, we could be on the street, and we could craft a frame out of the real things that are, are happening, the real people going to work, the traffic, whatever, the weather. Um, And yeah, I think even when w films that are a little less aggressively um, imagistic than Girl from Monday, you know, things like Ned Rifle, there was a lot of that. Just saying like, oh, the rain is coming, let the rain come, and, you know, during the shot. Uh, it just goes against all the, the basic skills you learned if you're somebody my age it, making films in the 80s. You know, oh my God, you just, you're so concerned about the consistency of exposure from one shot to the other. You still have to worry about that now. But I mean, I think with experience, you don't have to be quite as um, careful or restrictive on yourself. I think you just have a greater confidence. You know that if you understand the dialogue and if the performers understand it and all, you can. Um, you can do just about any scene, almost anywhere. Shooting on location is kind of akin to the best street photography. If you go out into a city or a town, I mean, especially cities, cities are geometry. And all you have to do is find the geometry that tells the story by moving the camera, you know, six inches over. Mm -hmm. 
let's take a look at how, we, how do we have this set up. I'm going to ask some of these questions from Blu-ray.com. And yeah. I think some screen names are supposed to pop up. Um, are any of the actors from your earlier films in future projects? Uh, when Jen, when's, what's, one person here is asking about uh, if there would be a chance of reteaming with Martin Donovan who I found to be a very captivating presence online recently. Yes. Um, well, he was in my last one, Ned Rifle. Uh, we hadn't worked together in a number of years, uh, but there was a opportunity there. I don't have a production in planned right now, so I'm not really thinking about anybody in particular. But um, yeah, there's quite, you know, for me, uh, a pleasure working with actors who I've known for decades. They um, they know all of my films and they know my tastes and sensibilities. And uh, we all change, of course. Uh, but there's a you know that attracts me. But I'm also just interested in other types of movies too. New people. The big challenge for me these days is finding new younger people the people who play the younger roles good uh, when i made say the long island trilogy i was young and my friends were young and we were making movies about young people uh, a lot of the times now i want to make movies about middle-aged people and older people and then when the younger characters come in i'm like wow i don't have anybody in mind <laughs> it used to be no problem the uh, another question is about whether you considered finding more foreign co-productions. To uh, <clears throat> the question here is about no such thing in Faye Grimm, but Flirt for me is one of the great examples of using uh, look, you know, foreign locations to suggest something that you wouldn't by just sticking to home turf. Uh, but actually, we, if you want, we could branch into talking about what you actually are working on, the series and other things that you hope to have coming soon. Yeah. Did you mention Flirt right there? Oh, Flirt, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, that was sort of a, that was the kind of thing that really could happen in the 90s, in the mid 90s, because there was all this international co-production. There was excitement about smaller um, director-driven, movies uh you know there was a real business there so we took advantage of that then but that doesn't really exist that much anymore you know i mean i and then and the the red tape was just prohibitive <laughs> because it was really hard um however uh no these days i'm mostly interested in writing um, episodic tv so i've developed three different episodic tv projects uh one of which may be close to something i don't know i'm i'm I, in order to do this kind of thing you really have to rub elbows with the corporations you know so you know which a lot of my career hasn't been um i made most of those films over 30 years without doing business with really huge corporations uh but now, since I aspire to make some of these stories as episodic uh, TV, yeah, I you know I have to learn some different skills. It's about learning how to do these Skype things and conference calls and endless meetings, uh, even before you submit the screenplays and stuff. So it's uh, different. I don't know where it's going to go. One of them could could become a reality this year. Has the experience with the multiple episodes of Red Oaks been both a calling card and sort of a, a, a valuable crash course for you in doing this? Yeah, it, it, was, it was a great experience, first of all. Uh, but yes, Gregory Jacobs, whose show Red Oaks is, uh, he immediately wanted to introduce me to uh, different people. And so he sort of teamed up with me as an executive producer. 
so that's helped me get in through different tours. Um, yeah, I learned um, something about crafting a half hour comedy, which is what I'm mostly interested in. Um, pacing a whole season of shows. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had been trying to get episodic TV projects going for five or six years before I got hired on Red Oaks. Um, but in fact, I think people couldn't take me seriously. They're like, come on, you're you. You're, you won't be a team player. You'll be like, really? I didn't say, you know, I, I like directing and I have 30 years experience at it. I mean, like, I'm probably valuable to you <laughs> in this way. And people just wouldn't believe that I would, uh, if they knew who I was, like for instance, if, a lot if, of the even, yeah. people are much younger and they're very busy and they're very attuned to what's been going on the past couple of years. So you have to really convince them that you, you know how to do this. You, you have made some money. Um, nice people, they just, you know, but they have a, a lot on their plate. But they've got to make 437 scripted series this year. And Amazon's got $8 billion. Come on, there's got to be room. Right, yeah. Yes, but there are reputations to be made or unmade as well. So That reminds me of a story in the 70s when Fred Zinnemann was quite old and still working. He had a project he was pitching, and it was a very enthusiastic but uneducated younger film executive. And they were talking about this project, and it was expensive, and it involved mountain climbing. And the young guy says, Mr. Zinnemann, just for a moment, just stop. Can you tell me some of your work? And Zinnemann paused and said, you first. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was before IMDb. So, you know, cut him some slack. Yeah. yeah. They don't have the stack of printouts in front of them. Right. Um, do filmmakers, uh, coming off of someone else's question, do filmmakers generally offer each other advice? Like the, someone wants to know what's the best advice, personal, professional, you receive from another filmmaker, but is that really something, hey, Hal, here's a thing you should do. Does that actually happen? Well, let me see. I met, I remember a couple of years ago, I met Lodge Kerrigan on the street. He lives not far from here. And uh, I had been living in Germany for five years, so I hadn't seen him in a long time. But he was like, Hal, you got to get into this TV thing. <laughs> he, was, uh, he says, it's great. I and mean, different kinds of shows to, to work on, and the pay is really good. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I, I have a lot of ideas myself, uh, but I am interested in, you know, I, I direct other people's stuff that, you know, a director of hire thing. But um, we do ask when I got, when Greg offered me the first episode of Red Oaks in 2015, I was very happy and excited. And I had read the script and I said, this is, this is a well-written script. It knows exactly how it wants to be funny, how it wants to be endearing, all that. But uh, I still called my, old cinematographer Mike Spiller, who's a very successful director and producer of television now in Los Angeles. And you know, I said, well, I've never worked for anybody else before. What am I supposed to expect? I just don't want to screw up. I really, I just want to do a good job. And Mike laughed really hard. He said, don't worry, just make the day, you know, shoot all the pages that they give you to shoot that day and make sure you have fun and get all the angles, cover everything. That was interesting. He said, don't assume anything. He said, you know, all the years we worked together, we made great assumptions about the audience's attention. Uh, so we wouldn't show certain things. We left a lot of key activity off frame. You know, he said, don't do that in TV. Really, if if they say he looks into his coffee cup, you know, really get the shot of the coffee cup, get the shot into the coffee. Um, 
and so you know that was different and fun but you know i learned a lot about i also had never worked with such uh an excellent and uh well financed crew really had top of the line teamsters and gaffers and grips and you know scenic artists i'd never had that before was did that reduce i also i really didn't work any different than i did my own films though um well, at the very least, it sounds like you've got a case of, with a professional crew like that. That's a stress reducer. You have fewer things to worry about. You can take it for granted. It's going to play. Yeah, yeah. My concern was really just I don't, I don't like working more than twelve hours. So I really, I avoid overtime. So the Teamsters told me that they don't make as much money when they work with me, but they see their children more. <laughs> So Woody Allen says, after five o'clock, I want a nice steak or I want to listen to music or I want to see basketball. I do not want to work. I think that's has been his uh, yeah. career. What else? Is Henry is the Henry Fool universe concluded? Yes, I think so. I think it is. I uh, people tell me never say never, but I uh, yeah, I just really feel like I've finished that off. And I'm interested in other things now. You did say that thematically, the characters and thematically, it's a little bit more toward early middle age. You're dealing with situations and characters. Is that, could you characterize the bulk of what you're talking about, which I wouldn't want necessarily to talk about, you know, giving things away that aren't in process yet. But do they generally deal with like group dynamics and families of a, and provisional families of an older generation? Yeah, uh, a little bit. Um, I'd like to, I've been writing a number of different stories about, well, for instance, I keep it pretty close to home, really. It's just, you know, what's it like to be a creative individual in his 50s? Um, a lot of times, um, my favorite, which is called uh, Where to Land, is about a guy kind of like me in his 50s who wants to change his line of work, he wants to make a career change, uh, and uh, what what's entailed in that, what's uh, what a real mundane, practical obstacles to something like that um, and it makes for great comic scenes too you know family members saying what are you why do you want to be a gardener why do you want to be a groundskeeper um, that kind of thing it's fun do you <clears throat> customarily arrive at your titles and not change them i mean there's a certain flat wryness to all the titles and then you've had your company's true fiction pictures and possible films and they're, yeah. they're quietly playful but do you play with more than one title or is it you just say this is that this is that title or maybe you have a title sitting around and suddenly you go this story can have this title how does all of that work and sometimes a title comes to you first and it's a little it's kind of a flag or an emblem of uh an emotional a certain emotional pitch that seems to be a little bit before you and you haven't grasped it yet you haven't been able to put it into words but it represents a certain kind of thing but i, I was just doing some writing for the this blog i'm doing for the kickstarter thing for tomorrow and um you know i'm going through my old notebooks to get the facts right from those days and i realized you know for a long time for like a year the script of amateur was called crisis hmm. that crisis was what i was working on for all that all that time i was in europe in 1992 doing promotion for simple man and trust and stuff like that i was working on this thing called crisis and folders and folders and stuff and it was only really late in the game that I decided to call it amateur. So it does change sometimes. 
the novelist Joseph Heller who wrote Something Happened and uh, Catch-22 liked to say anything that he worked on, he immediately had to figure out a provisional title that usually didn't stay, but a first line and a last line. And with mm -hmm. Something Happened, I believe the opening line is Something ha uh, is When I see a closed door, I get the willies. And then the closing line was going to be I am a cow, which he didn't keep. But he said he did need to be working toward I am a cow for the two years he was writing that project. <laughs> wow. Well, sir. You can always change it and, you know, and then you can, something else is a crisis. But you discovered things along the way to simple men. I just uh, also rediscovered that when I wrote the script, the, the final line of the movie, don't move, which is the first line of the movie. That wasn't in the script. That was discovered in the editing. In fact, not even in the editing. It was in the mix, the sound mix. It was that late. There was another line, and it, we didn't have to change the picture cut. So uh, I just went, I don't know. I, it was almost like a group decision. It was me, Jeff Taylor, who was my music producer, Riley Steele, the mixer. Steve Hamilton, the editor. There was something I wasn't liking about the cadence of the last line I had written. And, and then I said, yeah, what well, he wants, we need that word, like don't move. So we actually just went, we took the recording from the beginning of the movie and had the actor come in and just copy it, Damien Young. We just so you didn't it. actually like repeat the line already recorded. You did have him do the line again. So. Yeah, because it had to be somebody else. Uh, but I wanted Damien to be able to say and, and hear in his head how Bob had said it at the top of the film. Are there, um, aside from there being 437 scripted series made in the past year, are there things that encourage you? I mean, you sound very uh, cheerful and productive. Um, yeah, I yeah, mean, I try to making the industry this, you know, this true fiction that we call the independent cinema of the '90s forward. You know, that's transformed and transmuted. I mean, you seem though, as I was saying about something else, not to be a person who is nostalgic and letting that get in their way. You're actually saying these are the challenges today, and here's how I might meet them. Yeah, uh, I've always been that way. Just. Um... I like to work, but I'm a realist too. So it, whatever the circumstances are, I have to roll with the punches. I mean, technology changes. That's the thing. It's not simply that times change. It's very specifically that technology changes. And when technology changes, entertainment changes. Uh, and I think we could just see this through history and certainly history of motion pictures. Um, I mean, I was a kid in the 70s when everybody thought all the movie theaters in the world were going to close down on one weekend because of the VHS, you know, VHS tapes, you know, everyone was so terrified of that. Uh, but it did, you know, there's a, a shift about how people got their entertainment. And then when it's become this, you know, uh, I was pretty alert to this early information technology and all this mostly because of my uh, association with Stephen Hamilton who was my editor from Simple Man on who had come from an IT background uh, and is very very smart and gifted about these things and so you know even when we were making Simple Man we were talking about the future of computer-based film editing you know and then we did that with amateur. Uh, and then I also, after uh, Steve went kind of back into tech design world, he's not specifically in the, the motion picture business anymore, but Kyle Gilman, who's my editor for many years, many of these later films, is also a brilliant um, technologist. Uh, and so, you know, I just look for the opportunities, really. Uh, you know, I've always known that my not just my taste, but my ambitions are not mainstream. Um, so there's no reason to, you know, 
complain about not getting the work that more mainstream or, or the exposure that other mainstream uh, entertainments uh, enjoy. You know, the, the idea is to just focus on how do I get to the people who I don't, I'm not alone. I know I'm one of hundreds of thousands of people who enjoy a particular type of work, but I've got to get to those people. Uh, and so that's how I've always dealt with social media and the internet stuff right from the beginning trying to figure out how to how to use it so that I can have a more direct relationship with the people who are most likely to be interested in what I do um, so these crowd you know, crowdsourcing Kickstarter which is the one I use uh, has been really a great it's a, it's a platform that says I I really know now who my fan bases all over the world um, if social media if they're computer literate and i know i have a lot of fans who are my age and older who probably don't spend that much time on the internet so it's harder to get to them but i try i still try and then uh it sounds like you've also done a very good job of knowing how to parcel out <clears throat> the Kickstarter rewards and such. As you said earlier, it's like you're, it's essentially an advanced purchase at a fair price of the Blu-ray or the set, whereas uh, some artists wind up just getting lost in the morass of details and fulfillment. Yeah, you've got to be careful. You don't want to, you don't want to promise too much. Um, you, you want to know this right now is a perfect uh, example. Chris McChain and I, you know, went through the whole thing from beginning to end with the Henry Fool trilogy. So we now really know how to do this and, um, and how to keep costs down. The first time out, we made a couple of mistakes by going into business at certain companies to do particularly subtitling, you know, that was wasted money. Uh, so now we think we won't we won't make those mistakes and so it so we could offer the the, the pre-order price could be less um yeah i just uh, i don't want to get to the first time i think when we did um the kickstarter for neg rifle in 2013 we were encouraged to offer a lot of really complicated things like lunch, lunch with Parker Posey. That turned out to be incredibly difficult because <laughs> this is, you know, a person who's a big fan and would love to have lunch with Parker Posey, but he lives a, a couple, you know, they, they live in Chicago and they say, oh, well, we're coming to New York in June. Can we set this up? But of course then Parker is, in Vancouver shooting a movie, you know, so it, it never happened. And you feel bad about that because you, you, know, you can't make good on the, the thing you promised. So I try to just promise really basic things, things I know I can actually deliver. And that's recognizing, you know, that, that was how Kickstarter started. You had a few exotic things for like executive producer credit, meet the stars. And now a number of people, including yourself are discovering Let's deliver what we're here for. Let's deliver the movie and a little bit of an extra experience for the subscriber, but we don't have to create a circus. Yeah. Um, I, I think it might be a little easier for me. I've had this conversation with younger filmmakers and artists of different kinds. I mean, I was able to start this type of activity, this type of commerce after 30 years of building a fan base um a lot of people are starting out you know the, with their first movie or their second movie and so they have to build that awareness they have to build that fan base that's harder and you have a library that's been the secret through the 20th century that the american studios stayed in business by shifting their catalog their libraries of yeah. Or 6,000 films into the newer funnels of commerce. And you 
<clears throat> without using the phrase funnels of commerce about your films, you do have a, uh, a library that you are preserving and uh, sharing again. Yeah, yeah. Now, getting some of these titles out of those funnels of commerce uh, was the big part um, because I wasn't really in charge of getting them into those um, funnels back in the day. So I had, you know, I had to wait for a lot of licenses to expire uh, or in certain cases just negotiate with people who had licenses for some of these titles, but had no intention of doing anything with the titles. You know, like Trust for years was just sitting in this library uh, of a huge corporation who ha had no idea about it and didn't care about it and had no intention of doing anything with it. And I said, well, why don't you just sell me a sublicense or, or just give it to me, I'll, take the film out commercially, I'll take 10% and I'll give you all the money. For me, it's just about having this film out. You know, they were like, no, we don't do that. That's against company policy. That's how it So, um, yeah, I'm lucky I'm in a situation financially where I can, you know, I do have the means to just slowly pull these things together. And uh, since, you know, it's my, life's work that's what i've been doing i just want it presented correctly and well um yeah that sounds like a wonderful moment thank you always a pleasure to talk to you and i'm looking forward to seeing these great new additions and also a special thank you to olive films partner blu-ray.com for promoting this edition of spoiler alert thank you olive Make sure to check out Hal's website and get the information on all the stuff we've been talking about. Thanks. HalHartley.com, that's the place. That's the one. Okay. Is that it?